Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You may be seated. So maybe you're new here and you're wondering what we're all about. Maybe this will help. We hope that in this church you will find people who are welcoming and spiritually passionate. A place where relationships are a big deal. A place where you can worship God freely and intimately. A place to hear practical and relevant messages from the Bible. A place that wants you to be involved in serving this community. A place where you can be yourself and find friends. A place where you can grow into God's plan for your life. But most importantly, a place where you can find an exciting relationship with Jesus. Welcome to our church. We're glad you're here. So, when is the last time you invited somebody to church? I've learned that if we will think about it during the week, God will give us unusual, unexpected opportunities to invite someone to church. So I want you to watch this short video. It may give you an idea of how you could invite somebody to church this week. Watch. like every week but would you like to ride to church with me oh come on mrs edwards you'll like my church we have some hot music it may not be what you're bumping at all but it's hot we get down what do you say mrs edwards oh i suppose I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edwards, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. <sighs> okay, here we are. So this week, look for uh, unusual opportunities. You never know when you'll have an opportunity to invite somebody to church. There's a great story told about the great painter Leonardo da Vinci. One day in his studio, Leonardo started a work on a large canvas. Uh, he labored on it. He chose the subject matter carefully. He arranged the perspective. He sketched the outline, applying the colors and developing the background. Then for some unknown reason, he did the strangest thing. He stopped painting even though it was unfinished. He then called one of his students and asked the student, would you finish the painting for me? Well, the student was absolutely flabbergasted. I mean, think about it. How, how could I possibly finish a painting by, by one of the world's great masters? And so the student began to protest and, and explain his inadequacies and his insufficiencies for such a grand task. But finally, Leonardo da Vinci silenced his student and he said to him, will not what I have done inspire you to do your best? 
Jesus Christ came to earth 2,000 years ago. And we might say when he was here, he started a painting. He started a painting, but three years in, he left it unfinished. He has now placed the brush in our hands and has commissioned us to finish the task. Now, the New Testament uses a number of different word pictures to describe this, uh, this something new that Jesus began. We have looked at two in this series, a family and a body. Uh, it's to be a family where we belong. It's to be a body where we serve. And so today we conclude our series, Let the Church Be the Church. And we're going to look today at one final image Jesus paints for us so we can better understand an absolutely critical dimension of who we are as the church of Jesus Christ. And that is we are to be a kingdom where we grow. Now Jesus spent three years on earth establishing his kingdom. Now he called his kingdom the kingdom of God. He began, in fact, his three-year public ministry with these very words. It's recorded in several of the Gospels, and I put it in your notes. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. So for three years, Jesus continually talked about his kingdom. Do you realize, now think about it, nearly every one of Jesus' parables begins the same way. Think about it. Remember how nearly every one of the parables, parables began? The kingdom of God is like, remember that? The kingdom of God is like a man who went out and sowed seed. The kingdom of God is like a man who found buried treasure. The kingdom of God is like. That was his lead line for three years. And so, foundational today, here's what we need to remember in your notes. For Jesus, the message of the kingdom of God is very clear. God is king. God is king, and his people, that would be us, we are the subjects in his kingdom, okay? Or another way of thinking about it is this. God is king, and you are not. We don't have to study the kingdom of God, though, very long until we discover that God's kingdom is very different from other earthly kingdoms. We learn very quickly in the Gospels that God is not a tyrant king. In fact, he's a benevolent king. That this king, his goal is not to hold us down as slaves to control us, but it's actually to, to liberate us and to set us free as his adopted children. In a phrase, God wants to create an environment where we can grow, where we can mature, where we can actually be transformed and changed to become everything God created us to be. It's helping us get liberated from the hurts, the habits, and the hang-ups that have held us in bondage our whole life to get free of those things so we can really be liberated to become everything God created us to be. I love Colossians 1 because in Colossians 1, Paul describes the connection between growing and God's kingdom. He, he weds the two together in one paragraph. And it's in Colossians 1. Let me read it to you beginning in verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruit, hear the growth there? Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So that you may have great endurance and patience. 
and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom, in the what? In the kingdom of light. Now watch this. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Did you notice the connection? We're to grow in knowledge, grow in strength, grow to become more like Christ because we've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the glorious kingdom of his son. Now, let's get practical. What's this supposed to look like? I mean, here at Grace Community, if we become an outpost of God's kingdom in the world, specifically in Roswell, what's it going to look like? Not just on Sunday morning, okay? What's it going to look like for us to be the kingdom of God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday in our neighborhoods, our families, our jobs, our schools? Wherever we go, what's, what's it going to look like? How can understanding this truth help us be the church? All right, to answer these questions, we're going to turn back to the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. We're going to go to Jesus Christ himself. We're going to listen carefully as Jesus describes for us the transforming power of the kingdom of God. All right, are you ready? Here's the first challenge. Let God's kingdom transform us. You know, you got to let God transform you. You can't give away what you don't have. God can't use you to transform the world if you haven't first been changed. And so Jesus tells a parable beginning in Mark 4, verse 26. Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. In other words, this is what it's supposed to look like. A man scattered, uh, scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Okay, what is Jesus trying to teach us in this simple parable? Growth happens. That's it. Growth happens. Growth happens to people in God's kingdom. In other words, here at Grace, if we're going to be an outpost of God's kingdom, here at Grace, growth is a given. Spiritual growth here at Grace, it's a given. It's the rule, not the exception. That means that when we look over our church and all of you as members, if, if we are not growing spiritually, alarm bells should sound. Red flags should start waving. We should say, uh-oh, something is wrong. We're not growing because growth in God's kingdom is normal and natural. Now, what does that mean for you? That means when you look in the mirror... If you haven't grown spiritually in the last three years, five years, ten years, if you look back a decade and you go, yep, I'm about as spiritual today as I was ten years ago. Alarm bells should sound. Red flags should wave. Why? Because in God's kingdom, growth happens. Night and day. Now, I love you. I'm glad to use the farmer. Can you imagine a farmer going out preparing the soil, planting the seed, getting everything just right, turning on the sprinklers, you know, and, and four months later, nothing's coming up. And a friend says to the farmer, hey, I thought you planted seed. What's wrong? And the farmer goes, yeah, I don't know. You know, you, you never know. Well, aren't you worried about it? Nah, I'm not worried about it. You know what you call that? An unemployed farmer. 
If that farmer does all that work, he expects that plant to grow. Whether he's awake or asleep, night or day, he doesn't know why. He, just, he knows that if you do this, growth happens. If we are an outpost of God's kingdom here at Grace, growth happens. Okay, growth happens. This means the church of Jesus Christ is designed to be a place where, where people grow up. Well, they grow up. Anybody know a 40, 50-year-old person? They still act, act like a little teenager. Maybe some aren't even there. Maybe a five-year-old. And you're going, something's wrong. Yeah. Well, here at Grace, we want transformational growth to happen. And it happens to the entire person. So in your notes, transformational growth happens naturally. See, it's a natural byproduct when we tap into the truth of God's word and the power of God's spirit. I love Romans 12 too. Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you're going to be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I love Ephesians 3.16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit, where? In your inner being. So what, what are we learning here? That being a member of God's kingdom, guys, it literally has the power to radically change who you are from the inside out. You're, you get your mind renewed until finally it changes your behavior. You don't have to be the way you've always been. You can be different, radically, wonderfully different. Have you noticed that sin has a way of stunting your growth? Well, God's truth and God's spirit have a way of accelerating your growth. That's why the church needs to be an environment where growth happens. Here's the way... Here's the way the Apostle Paul told his young pastor friend Timothy. Here's the way it works, Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, now watch, which are able to make you wise, for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is, what's the word there? Useful. Now don't read over that too quickly. Do you realize the word of God is useful? Well, for what? It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. You know what you call that? Growth. You're going to learn stuff you didn't know. You're going to kind of get rebuked when you need to kick in the seat of the pants. You're going to be trained in righteousness. Here's the point, guys. When a church like Grace begins to see itself as an outpost of God's kingdom, the members here begin to experience positive change, spiritual transformation, it's just natural. That's why I've said very often from this podium, the church is the hope of the world. God, we're it. The church is the hope of the world. It's not going to be changed by politicians or governments or human institutions. True, genuine spiritual transformation. I'm looking at us. The hope of the world is in this room. We must see ourselves like that. That means the church literally holds the key to growth and maturity in all kinds of areas. Do you realize that Jesus Christ can make you a better person? He can make you a better father, mother, sister, brother. Oh, husband, woo! Man, God can make you a better husband, a better wife, a better boss, a better employee. Hey, even a better teacher, a student. Doesn't matter where you are. God can transform you 
into a better person. Now, just look around in this room today. Look around and you will see a room full of changing people. Okay, not perfect. We're not there yet. But we're changing. That's why I put one of my favorite quotes in your notes today. We're not yet what we want to be, but we're not what we used to be. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Ephesians 4, how about this passage? So Christ himself gave us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become, what? Grown-ups, mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then you will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. No, watch. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. And then he ends this way. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, what? Grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We must let God's kingdom transform us. Challenge number two. Let God's kingdom transform others. Immediately following the parable we just read in Mark chapter 4 is a second parable beginning in verse 30. It says, again Jesus said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? In other words, what does it look like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's a uh, it's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows to become the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. What a great parable. So again here, notice we see the power of God's kingdom to create transformational growth in us. However, did you notice this is not the end of the story? There is a goal to your growth. There is a purpose for your maturity. What is it in your notes? The ultimate purpose of our transformation is the transformation of others. It's the transformation of others. Our growth is not self-centered. It's not some kind of narcissistic, narcissistic experience. No, we grow for the benefit and the welfare of others. Now, I'm, I love the analogy of this shade tree, that this mustard seed grows so big it's got big old branches sticking out there. That means that Grace Community, we're to be like a shade tree in our community, strong and sturdy, big limbs, that means, guys, we need to be a safe refuge for all kinds of birds. We are a refreshing place of shade from the scorching heat. So, I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell. Here it is. Here is the message for us. You ready in your notes? Grace is a church for the birds. <laughs> this boy for the birds. And believe me, I have to say that in our 20 years, we have attracted a very interesting flock of birds here at Grace. All kinds. We've attracted some songbirds. Hey, you heard some of them earlier. Yeah. Uh, we have attracted birds of all colors. I love that. All kinds of, uh, of nationalities represented here at Grace. I love that. Um, We've attracted some elegant birds and a lot of common sparrows, few wild turkeys, <laughs> Lindell, <laughs> some newborn chicks, 
Yeah. Okay, let's go. A few old buzzards, all right? We got a few old buzzards. Don't point at them. It embarrasses them. We've also extended our branches to a lot of wounded birds in need of healing. We've extended our branches to many, many tired birds who just need to come here and rest. We're all very different kinds of birds in this room, but we all have one thing in common. We found Grace Community to be a place where we can enjoy some shade and protection, a little healing, and a grace-filled place where we can grow. And now, we have a tremendous privilege and responsibility of paying it forward. We now invite other birds to come and rest on our branches. We invite others to come and experience the transformational power of God's growth in their lives. That's really why 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, this is our commission. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself. Yay, aren't you glad? He reconciled us to himself through Christ. And, here's the second part, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, what does that look, look like? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore, oh wow, look at this. Who are we? We are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What a challenge. I must tell you that being this kind of transformational church, it's terribly inconvenient, terribly costly. I'm just being honest with you. It would be much easier to have a uh, eagles only, no sparrows allowed church. That'd be easy. We could advertise, oh, how about this one? Healthy birds only. Wounded birds need not apply. We could do that. It'd be a lot more comfortable to put up a no vacancy sign out front, adopt a we four and no more, and say, you know, our branches are pretty full right now. We're happy. We're content. We four and no more. The rest of you, fly away. Find another branch. Be a lot easier. Sure would be a lot less work for me. I'm just saying. A lot less work for me if there were less of you. But there's only one problem with this attitude. It violates the kingdom mandate. It violates what Jesus Christ has said. Go and make disciples. He never said go and make disciples until. Until your branches are heavy. Until it's inconvenient. Until it's too costly. He just said, until I come, you go make disciples. In your notes, this means as long as there are people in our community who don't know Jesus, our kingdom work is unfinished. It's unfinished. We must let God's kingdom transform us and then through us, others. So what does it take for a church like Grace to be the church? We must be a family where people can belong. We must be a body where people can serve. We must be a kingdom where people can grow. If we fail here, we fail the king. And he is the king, and we are not. This is the movement Jesus Christ inaugurated 2,000 years ago. It is now the movement that we must continue to impact our community. The question is, are you willing to be an agent of change in your little corner of Roswell? 
Remember that story of Leonardo da Vinci and his student? This is now our story. Jesus began the painting of this masterpiece on a canvas of a fallen world. And now he hands us the paintbrush. And he says, you finish. Will not what I have done inspire you to do your best? May each of us eagerly, gratefully, joyfully pick up the brush and finish his masterpiece. Let the church be the church. Let's bow. God, we're grateful and yet overwhelmed by the responsibility you have placed in our hands. We look now in our hands, Lord, and we see a paintbrush and we see an unfinished masterpiece. Father, will you give us the willingness, the discipline, whatever it takes to finish the work you have begun? And may we do it with gratitude in our hearts. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.